Hi, and welcome to the latest MASTS webinar. Uh, today we're joined by Dr. Francisca Broll, uh, who's a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Oceanography at Dalhousie University in Canada. Uh, Francisca works on fish behaviour and ecology and development of microscale animal tags. Uh, she's currently here at St. Andrews under a, as a visiting fellow under the MASTS Postdoctoral and Early Career Research Exchange Scheme, or PECA, for those of you who love your acronyms. Um, just quickly before I hand over to Fran, uh, regarding questions, um, you can type questions in at any point during the webinar, uh, and then Fran will address these at the end. Uh, if I would be grateful if you could type in questions um, when you think of them, that would be great. So without any further ado, I shall now hand over to Fran. Thanks, John. Hello, everyone. I will be talking a little bit about my um, the work that I've done in the last few years on my PhD. I just finished in February, and a little bit of what I'm doing during my postdoc at Dalhousie and also here in uh, St. Andrews. Okay. Um, at the for biology research in fish, the foundational concept in fish biology is the generalized energy budget, which is essentially the energy consumed equals met met metabolism, waste, and growth. And accurate measure means of measurements of these parts are important for fisheries management and the understanding of adaptation evolutionary processes. And typically, what we like to measure is activity, consumption, growth, reproduction, and waste. And it's crucial that we get as accurate measurements as possible for these parameters. And this is now accomplished with electronic tagging technology, such as biologging and biotelemetry techniques. To put this more in a framework of bi fish bioenergetics, you can see here the, um, the fish bioenergetics model as energy consumed as respiration, waste, and growth. And we can use a variety of techniques to measure these different components, such as heart rate monitors, um, video analysis, fine scale positioning, positioning, temperature, salinity measurements of the internal milieu, um, and uh, one of which with, that I'm focusing on is acceleration. And accelerometer sensors measure the change in animal position, which creates an accelerated force in three dimensions. And we can relate this to activity and behavior. Unlike um, temperature records and fine, fine scale positioning, however, acceleration data is not very intuitive. And there is a challenge of relating these acceleration signals to characteristics of interest, such as food consumptions or respiration. And that is kind of the uh, center of my work. And I'm mostly interested in, in developing uh, methods of how to turn acceleration data into animal behavior and movement. And here I'm showing you a time series of acceleration over a 24-hour period that uh, tagged fish. In this case, it was a, a safe. And you can see the forward, lateral, and vertical accelerations, which correspond to the three dimensions of movement within this animal. And I hope I can... Uh, emphasize or visualize how difficult it is to analyze these types of data sets because unlike a temperature record, this is very non-intuitive for interpretation. Luckily, in the 60s and 70s, people have done video analysis of um, fish movement and related that to acceleration records. And therefore, we already know that fish swimming, for example, is very well described as it, as it uh, emphasizes as a sinusoidal wave with, with the frequency corresponding to um, the tail beat frequency of the animal. So here I'm showing a time series of acceleration uh, during slow swimming versus fast swimming on the right-hand side of the screen. And you can see that the frequency during fast swimming is much higher than during slow swimming. So you can relate these signals to activity as well as um, a proxy of energy expenditure. However, if we're interested in much more fine-scale movements, such as uh, consumption rates, for example, feeding behavior, or energy expenditure rates, such as escape behaviors, we can see that these signals occur over very, very short time scales. So in the case of feeding behaviors, you can see on the upper side of the screen, we have um, an event that occurs over 250 milliseconds. And the same is the case for escape responses that these animals exhibit and are important to qualify and quantify because they, they mean very different things in terms of energy budgets. We can also relate acceleration signals to uh, events that, that uh, or movements that occur during, for example, spawning or nest building activities that in some species ex are exhibited as lateral rotations, and we can quantify, quite, quantify these movements. 
So in the search of developing acceleration uh, techniques to turn acceleration into animal behavior and movement, I focus my work so far mostly on the development of computational algorithms that extract swimming activity, fish behavior, and uh, size. And in order to uh, accomplish these uh, computational methods, I developed a high-frequency accelerometer data logger that was specific for fish applications. In the process of collecting these data and developing this technology, I also recognize that there are significant limitations in the sensor properties in the tag load and how they may affect the extractive behavior from this new technology. And I'm going to go into these three different areas and draw on examples from different species that I've worked with in the past. Typically, in order to extract behavior in the context of movement from wild animals, uh, specifically fish, using accelerometer tags, it's, it's beneficial if, if uh, we have validated data from experimental setups. So in this case, validated acceleration data are collected using visual observations that may be camera observations or, or personal observations to train classification algorithms. And these are then used to extract the behavior and characteristics of interest uh, from field experiments where visual observations are not possible. And in both of these cases, there's a need for high-frequency microaccelerometers that are specific for fish applications. And in designing such a technology, there are a variety of considerations, such as the sampling frequency and resolution of the sensor, the data storage, and the recording time. And there is typically a trade-off between data accuracy recording duration and tag size. By incre increasing data accuracy, often the recording duration is decreased and the tag size uh, is increased because it re directly relates to battery power. Um, so I developed a tag, we are calling it the MBLOG Mini, which is a high-frequency customizable accelerometer tag, and it's mostly used for laboratory um, uh, purposes. It's a tri-axial accelerometer data logger and it is modular, as you can see here on the uh, left picture here, it consists of a pressure case, a battery that is rechargeable, and a circuit board with a micro SD card. And the fact that it, uh, it comes in these three different components, it can be uh, adjusted in terms of battery size, which uh, results in adjustable recording time. The sampling frequency can be easily adjusted up to 1 kilohertz, and the resolution of the sensor is also easily adjustable up to 16G. And given the memory solution is a micro SD card, so it's essentially unlimited, at least for the, for the duration of the experiments that we're working with, and the tag is reusable as it can be recharged. We have developed this uh, and are now commercializing it through uh, our company called Maritime Biologgers, and we're also developing different kinds of uh, tags, such as the MBLOG Inertial, which is a 9 degrees of freedom uh, incorporates a 9 degrees of freedom sensor that also has a gyroscope and a magnetometer. And these are much larger in size and often used on marine mammals. So the first uh, example study I want to present is on how to extract food consumption in fish using accelerometer tags and how uh, sensor properties can potentially limit these extracting these these events. In order to, uh, this is more of a really a proof of concept study, and we used a model species, the giant sculpting. You can see it here in the right uh, upper right hand corner of the slide. And we asked the question is if it's possible to extract uh, short, fast start movements in this fish. And these kinds of movements occur during feeding strikes, which is the consumption part of the equation, and during escape responses. And given that these, these uh, responses are very similar in terms of movement, we really wanted to see if we could differentiate between the two because it was really important for us to be able to identify feeding strikes. And we also asked the question is how good are we at determining these events versus spontaneous movements that include swimming or relocation or uh, shifting on the substrate. And again, both of these uh, movements are relevant to energy budgets and to the fish bioenergetics model. And in order to determine computational algorithms, we extracted validated fast starts in the laboratory. The right-hand side is an example of one of these acceleration traces. This specifically is an escape response. And we mimicked a predator in the lab following protocols that had been established in the 90s. And we used these validated fast starts to train a two-step classification algorithm. And the way that this algorithm works is, I, I won't get into the statistical details, but it essentially differentiates between fast start movements and spontaneous events, and the classification probability is 90%. And it then 
differentiates between escape and feeding behavior with a classification probability of 77%. So in summary, this algorithm is capable of extracting feeding and escape movements in this model species. And we believe that following this outline of techniques we created, this could be translated to different fish species and um, potentially different behaviors. Now, if you look at the, um, the escape movement, you can see that it occurs over a very short time frame, within hundreds of milliseconds. So given the um, low sampling frequency of accelerometer tags that were used in the literature previously, especially on fish, we asked the question is, um, how can these, uh, these sampling frequencies of the, of the sensor technology potentially affect the extraction of these high uh, energy and fast movements that occur during, for example, feeding strikes in the species? So we looked at the detection probability, as I'm showing here, as a function of sampling frequency. And uh, this shows the detection probability in the black line as well as the identification probability in the dashed line. And when you look at the... Um, the red box on the right-hand corner, this is indicating the sample frequency that we had used in our study, which was 100 hertz, um, and our identification and detection probabilities. And it becomes, very, it becomes clear that with lower sampling frequencies, both of these probabilities significantly decrease. And for example, at, um, at uh, 32 hertz, which was the maximum sampling frequency that had previously been used, the identification probability of the algorithms that we developed was down to 60%. I just want to mention that at 50% uh, detection and identification probability, the algorithms are essentially useless. Uh, just to um, visualize this a little bit better, I want to show you two videos. And one was taken with a um, high frame rate camera. So this video was taken with a, a camera that, that takes 500 frames per second, and it shows one feeding strike. The animal, the fish here on the bottom, carries the accelerometer tag, and its prey, which are sand lambs, comes in from the bottom right-hand corner. So I'll just play this video, and you can see as soon as the predator recognizes the prey, it starts striking towards it, and uh, it successfully captures the prey item. Um, the next video is of the same movement, however, this was taken with a regular USB camera, typically of what we would be seeing if we were looking in the tank while this movement was happening. And it's exactly the same, the same uh, setup, the fish is here and the prey comes in on the right-hand right corner of the screen. Uh, you really have to pay attention here because this happens so quickly that it's, it's very difficult to see. And there it was, so I'll just play it again to show you how quickly this really happens. Okay, so the reason I'm playing this to you is because I think that the video are really emphasizing on how different sampling frequency can, can um, have an effect on what uh, is being captured. And in this case, the lower uh, frame rate camera essentially represents the low sampling frequency accelerometer and vice versa. So we shouldn't really be surprised that we see these decreases in, in uh, our ability to detect these events given low sampling frequency of the technology because it, it uh, results in data loss, decreased algorithm performance, and of course would affect behavioral output. And from this work, we would recommend that 50 hertz is required for fast-moving animals. However, the higher, really, the better. So there is this trait of increasing sampling frequency that may reduce and decrease duration. And this is really important because if, if uh, animals are tagged in the wild with low sampling frequency technology, it might give the researcher the impression that these animals aren't very active. But what you're really measuring is not the activity of the animal, but you're simply measuring compromised data due to your low sampling frequency. Another, uh, another uh, part of the bioenergetics model that we're really interested in is measuring growth in fish. And as there's no in-situ measurement of growth, uh, we hypothesized that we could use acceler accelerometer tags to do this. Um, measuring size of time is very important because it affects life history characteristics, for example, metabolic rate and the reproductive potential, and it is a really crucial tool for population modeling in terms of growth rate. Measuring, acceleration, measuring growth with acceleration is very non-intuitive. However, there's some empirical data that suggests that at constant speed, when animals are swimming steadily, tail beat frequency is proportional to one over length. 
and this there was a study published in 2007 that looked at a variety of animals from turtles to birds to sperm whales and created this relationship between tail bead frequency and length. And uh, I hypothesized that if this relationship is true, then we, we should be able to predict length based on tail bead frequency by simply inverting this relationship. As I've already mentioned, tail bead shows up as a, as, a, as a sine wave in the lateral acceleration, and therefore we can easily extract this signal and create an estimate of dominant tail bead frequency. So I developed an algorithm to extract steady swimming in two species of fish. One is a short-nosed sturgeon and the other one is uh, safe. And this algorithm is based on zero crossings and a variability threshold. And I then calculated this uh, estimate of dominant tail beat frequency during steady swimming. And when looking at the uh, relationship between dominant tail beat frequency and length as plotted here on the left-hand side, for the two different species, one the pollock, uh, the other one the short-nosed sturgeon, we can see that uh, tail wave frequency does in fact scale with one over length. Another, um, another result from the study is that this is a species-specific relationship, so we get two different intercepts for these relationships. While the slope is the same, the intercept is different. So we cannot confirm the idea that across different species um, this relationship holds. However, within species, tail wave frequency seems to scale with one over length. At the same time, when estimating swimming speed, species-specific swimming speed is independent of size. And there are two implications of this. The first is that we can actually potentially use tail frequency to estimate swimming speed um, uh, size. And the other is when you look at these estimates of swimming velocity as well as tail frequency, the, the uh, dominant tail frequencies are much, much lower than what is predicted in the literature, and so are the swimming speeds. So we're seeing swimming speeds that are about one body length a second maximum, not uh, something that's previously used to just two to five body length swimming speed, uh, which is an interesting observation. When then using uh, tail wave frequency to pre predict length, uh, we can plot the uncertainty of length prediction and clearly the uncertainty is lowest given the um, size inputs that we had used to establish this relationship. But another um, very reassuring result here is that we could potentially predict size with an uncertainty as low as 18% in, tr in short nose sturgeon. And when looking at their growth rate, this would allow us to extrapolate changes in size and time on a yearly basis and could potentially, therefore, deliver a way of estimating size and time in the wild based on these, um, based on these algorithms. Of course, uh, this was all lab-based. The, the, all these results are, are based on a lab study. So we're interested to see if these uh, lab-derived results apply in, on wild fish. So we tagged short and sturgeon with pop-up satellite tags. You can see me here deploying one of our sturgeons with a uh, pop-up satellite tag that was recording acceleration. And we went through the same exercise of estimating dominant tail beat frequency and created this very similar uh, figure of uh, the functional relationship between tail root frequency and length. And here you can see the lab sturgeon, which are showing as closed circles, and the open cir circles are the field sturgeon. So while we only had five animals to do this with, but the field sturgeon do fit into the prediction intervals of this, not the confidence intervals, but the prediction intervals of this relationship, which is reassur reassuring. However, the field tail root frequency is lower than expected. And I'm going to come back to that later, but what I want to do now is uh, point out the size of this tag here, and maybe some of you might have uh, wondered if this uh, if the size could potentially impede the functionality of this animal, and if that could be the reason why we're seeing these unpredicted estimates of tail beat frequency. And that brings me to the next part of the presentation, which is looking at uh, tag effect. So if we're thinking of measuring all these um, parts of the bioenergetic model, with this sensor technology, we really have to start thinking of how does that affect the animal and is what we're measuring really what's going on in the animal. And I designed a study that looked at specifically this uh, effect of tag load. Um, and uh, what we did is we tagged Atlantic cod uh, with external tags and we found that these benthic fish exhibited a scraping behavior to dislodge the tag. And this is very common in Atlantic cod when they're infected with parasites. So they do treat the external tag similar to how they would treat a parasite in that they, um, they swim along, as shown in this figure of acceleration here, 
they turn to their side and continue to beat their tail against the substrate and then turn up right again and swim, swim further. So this scraping behavior occurs during, uh, during parasite infection as well as when animals are tagged externally. And uh, we were interested in to see if the increased tag load would also result in, in tag effect. And therefore, we attach two different size tags, one on the left side you can see here, and a larger one on the right side. And we assess tag load as a, uh, in relation to the 2% body rule, which calculates tag weight over body weight. And typically in fish biology or fish tag biology, a 2% tag weight effect is assumed to be negligible. So all the tags that we had attached uh, had uh, less than 2% um, tag load. And I developed an algorithm that extracted this scraping behavior and quantified it. And here you can see a video that shows one of these scraping movements and the lateral rotation of the animal while it is swimming. And this actually occurs quite frequently. And the algorithm is very simple. It's based on angular rotation. And while it's powerful in extracting these scraping movements, it could also be used for extracting parasite load or even spawning behavior that occurs in some species of, for example, salmon uh, when they build their nests. Um, this is a few of the results that we found here. Uh, here I'm showing the time percent spent scouring. So how much time do they spend engaging in this behavior as a function of tag effect? So the tag effect is less than 2%, goes from 0.2 to 2%. And the time spent scouring is about 2 to 8 percent. You can see here that the amount these animals spend engaging in this behavior is independent of tag load. So even by reducing tag load, it doesn't necessarily reduce the uh, time spent scouring. So we assume that this is because these animals are actually feeling a sense of irritation, which is independent of tag load. And this also means that the acute cost from physical damage cannot be mitigated by tag load. Uh, unlike what was previously assumed as simply by reducing the size of the tag or the weight of the tag, we can't, uh, this doesn't necessarily result in a decrease in, in irritation effect on the animal. However, we also calculated a proxy for energy expenditure uh, called VEDBA. I'm not going to get into uh, this specific parameter uh, because there are some limitations with it, but if we assume that there's some sort of linear relationship between energy expenditure and uh, this, this parameter, we can estimate um, the, we can use it as a proxy for energy expenditure really. What we found here is that this proxy increases with increasing tag effect. So the higher the tag load, the higher this uh, proxy for energy expenditure during these scouring movements. And this could indicate that these animals are spending more energy when the tag load is higher than when the tag load is um, less. This could mean that chronic costs due to uh, energy expenditure during the scraping movement could potentially be mitigated by tag load. So there are two different things going on, and by reducing tag effect, we could potentially mitigate one of them. But in any case, what my suggestion is that the 2% body rule could potentially be invalid, simply because we can't just use tag weight to estimate tag effect, and um, we need to include things such as buoyancy, um, drag, and um, shape of the tag, additionally friction and attachment. So there's a lot more work that needs to be done uh, when tagging these animals. This brings me back to the field study that, that uh, we conducted with short sturgeon. sturgeon. Um, as you've seen that the tail, estimated tail beat frequency in these animals was much lower than predicted. And now I'm going to show you two different individuals that were tagged. One is the smallest individual at uh, 80 centimeters, and the other one was 110 centimeters. And the tag effect is between 3.3% and 1%. So the tag effect for this animal is pretty small. Um, first, you can see that there is just short after deployment. This shows the tail beat frequency uh, versus time since release. There's a resting period between two to four hours, and then the animals start moving likely dislocating uh, away from the site. And for the larger animal, the tail beat frequency oscillates at around 1 hertz, which is something that we had predicted for this uh, individual. But for the smaller animal, it seems like that, uh, that animal is, is going through a much longer and extended resting period. And uh, the tagging time was only two days, so we don't know what happened after. But when we look at the roll angle, which is kind of an indication of if these animals lose equilibrium, for the small individuals, there is quite significant roll angles, much higher than what you would expect dur uh, during normal swimming as exhibited by the other individual. So we can 
conclude from the study that at least there is significant impact on this on one of these fish due to handling effect effects uh, which is aff affecting behavior and that could potentially lead to death and this is especially relevant considering that this is an uh, this species is a, a very important catch and release fishery and recreational fishery so um, kind of take away from this part of the research is that while we are able to collect all these very interesting data uh, sets that could potentially inform us on the bioenergetics model of fish, we also really have to think about the tagging limitations and the sensor limitations of this, of this new technology. Um, now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about a project that I've been recently involved with on um, tagging Pacific halibut in Alaska. The so study species here is wild Pacific halibut. It's, it's, a, it's an extremely important um, fishery in Alaska and Western Canada. And we, we uh, were interested in activity and behavior in these animals. And we chose a study site, Port Frederick, which is on the southern, uh, uh, on the southern part of Alaska on the west coast here, indicated by that um, point on the map. And we uh, tagged various animals in a sheltered bay. This is Port Frederick. Uh, it's a maximum depth of 150 meters and these animals spend their summer month in this bay. And we tagged 14 individuals with pop-up satellite tags and they were um, physically retrieved after being deployed for one month and we had a 70% recovery rate, which was uh, we're quite happy about. And the release and retrieval locations were actually within 500 to 4 kilometers distance. So here you can see the release locations of the animals just after they were tagged. And in this map you can see the uh, point where the pop-up satellite tags were recovered after the one-month deployment. So they were fairly close within the range. So these animals hadn't moved. We presume that these animals hadn't moved very far within that one month of deployment. Um, we tagged them with pop-up satellite tags recording depth, temperature, and light at a one-minute sampling interval. And uh, they also had acceleration tags on them that were recording at 50 hertz. And this is an example of one of the tags. It is quite sizable. Uh, however, the animals that we tagged were, uh, were over 100 centimeters in size and um, we had also done a lab study with 15 captive halibut to see potential tag effects and measure activity and behavior in the lab to be able to potentially relate that to what was going on in the field. And here is just some data. This is a, uh, a 24-hour uh, period of um, acceleration data uh, from one of these animals. The purple uh, series indicates the depth profile during the deployment and this uh, red, blue, and yellow time series indicates the acceleration on the animal. One of the things that I haven't really gone into is a very important requirement when tagging any kind of animal with acceleration tags and that is that these tags have to be very firmly attached to the animal otherwise the movement of the tag may not correspond to the movement of the, um, of the body and, and, and therefore we can't relate the uh, output from the tag to actual behavior and activity. And I think that's mostly if you think of a person holding a balloon and uh, there's a, a strong wind, the balloon may move while the animal is stationary, uh, while the person who's holding the balloon is stationary. So this is a very similar uh, um, uh, illustration on what could potentially happen when a tag such as this tag here is attached to the animal with a single point attachment. Um, and we were quite concerned about this initially when we had tagged these animals. However, we did a comparative study in the laboratory to determine how these tags move in the water column when they're attached with a very short tether uh, in halibut, and here's a, a little movie that, that visualizes this kind of um, tag attachment. So here you can see the halibut sitting on the substrate and the tag on top of it, and eventually it starts moving. Starts de oh, I think the video is not working too well. I'll just see if I can fix that. So again, this is the tag, the halibut is sitting on the bottom, and at some point it decides to start swimming away, 
and unfortunately that isn't happening. I think the computer has a hard time dealing with this file. But we'll see if I can make it work. Yeah, as soon as the animal starts swimming, um, you can see how the tag uh, starts pitching. And what we actually found in doing these lab studies is that the, we can use the pitch angle of the tag to determine when the animal is actually moving and the oscillation of the tag. So kind of the bobbing frequency corresponds to the frequency of the tail beat during swimming movements. And this is, I uh, just want to show you one of the time series extracted from one of these events where the red line corresponds to the vertical acceleration. And when the animal is sitting stationary on the ground, you can see the line being fairly flat. And as soon as it starts moving, you can determine the pitch of the tag. And each of these uh, oscillations corresponds to the tail, roughly corresponds to the tail beat frequency of the tag, just given the way that the attachment works. So we decided we could use the tag pitch angle as a proxy for animal movement and activity and went on to extract activity from the acceleration signal. And this here is an example of the daily activity pattern where activity is expressed as a percent time active within a 10 minute interval. And here you have a time series. This is just one daily increment uh, for visualization uh, that shows the uh, time of activity and the blue bar indicates nighttime. So we're working in Alaska during the summer. This deployment was in July, and they actually only get about six hours of darkness during that time. So we have a very short period of darkness during that time, in case anybody's wondering why the night is so short. Um, we can also see that it's very difficult to examine any kind of differences between day and night time. But when looking at the uh, spectrogram of this, um, of this activity series, there's a couple of features that stand out. So first we have our, our night time, but we can, we can also look at the uh, low and high tides. So the orange, um, orange bars here indicate the time of low tide and the green bars indicate the time of high tide. And these kinds of features or patterns within the activity uh, also show up in the spectrogram as a tidal signal. It's around six and a half hours. You can see that throughout the throughout most of the day. And there's also seems to be a variability activity at the half tide signal. So what this leads me to believe is that these animals actually modulate their activity based on the tidal, um, tidal pattern in, in the bay, which is quite, the tidal difference is actually quite significant. We can now also examine the um, weekly activity pattern. So this is one week of data. We actually have a whole month of this. And um, can see that there's a few spikes during the day, during each day. And when we now look at the spectrogram, which visualizes these, uh, these patterns within the activity time series, there's a few, um, a few parts that I'd like to point out. The first one is this tidal pattern, which seems to be showing up, but not regularly throughout the whole week. The second one is around a 12 to 13 hour signal, which is again a full cycle of the tide, where the tide is happening at around 6.5 hours. And the next is a, um, is a daily periodicity. So they, these animals modulating, seem to be modulating their activity based on a diurnal cycle and a tidal cycle. And we can also see something really interesting, which is that there is, seems to be higher rates of activity at dusk which is just before uh, the sun sets. So we might be seeing some kind of foraging um, activity that relates to, uh, to dusk, as well as swimming activity relating to the, to the tidal um, series. Now, when we look at the uh, water column use during that tame, same time period, we can definitely see a diurnal pattern within the depth time series. This is a spectrogram based on uh, the depth time series. And it seems like these animals uh, show a very distinct diurnal pattern during this one week of deployment. And this is a work in progress, so we haven't, I've 
really started looking into this data set just now, but we are really interested to see how, how these patterns in the activity budget as well as in the, in the water column use of that evolve over this one month deployment because these animals are preparing to leave the bay to migrate to their spawning grounds, or at least that's what we assume sometime in October. So we're in the summer period where, these, where we expect these animals to most likely be feeding and staying in the same habitat and area. Now, looking at the uh, halibut water column used during that deployment, this is just one individual showing the uh, probability distributions of water column use during the nighttime and during the daytime. There's not much difference, actually. They mostly spend their time uh, in the depth lower than 60 meters, and it seems that the nighttime depth is lower at around 120 meters and then the average depth during the day, which is at about 90 meters. And this is what we have been uh, seeing from other deployments in, in, that, in that area. I actually looked at the activity during night and day, and it seems like that they're much more active during uh, these periods at, at lower depth than, than during the nighttime, which could indicate that they're going into the water column to feed. I was also really interested in looking at the variability of activity across individuals. So here I've just pulled out two animals, and uh, one is uh, 86 centimeters, the other one is 120, looked at, and looked at their daily activity. And there seems to be very little difference between those two animals. And another thing I want to point out is that these animals are very inactive. They spend about less than 20% of their time uh, during a day actually moving, and most of the time they spend stationary on the bottom um, uh, of the substrate. So they are was, their metabolic uh, rates are very, very interesting, and we're hoping to do some more research on that, maybe in captivity. But in general, daily activity in halibut is very low. We're also looking at the activity, uh, average activity over time. So here we have our uh, 28 uh, days of deployment, and I plotted two different individuals. The red one um, is 120 centimeters, and the blue one is 86 centimeters. And we can see that there is quite a lot of variability in daily activity over time, and there seems to be some kind of correlation between these two animals, while not uh, over the whole time period, but there are definitely these two, the timing of uh, peaks of activity are fairly correlated across these two individuals. And this, uh, this deployment day actually corresponds to neap tide. So I think based on all of these uh, indicators, the tidal rhythm seems to be very important for these animals. And they seem to be adjusting their activity patterns based on the tide. Of course, we also looked at uh, the much higher resolution activity, which is tail beat frequency. So we can extract uh, tail beat frequency from these individuals. And this shows the distribution of tail beat frequency for the three individuals that we, um, that we tagged with high frequency accelerometers. And we actually retrie retrieved the tags. And you can see that the larger individual, which is uh, in, in light blue, has a much lower tail beat frequency than the smaller individual, which is in, in dark uh, black here. So there seems to be a functional relationship between size and tail beat frequency, very similar to what we had already seen with short nose sturgeon and, and pollock. Of course, using three individuals uh, is very limited in terms of actually finding statistical power and determining this functional relationship. However, we had also conducted a study in the lab with captive halibut. So what we did is we looked at the dominant tail beat frequency within these captive halibut, um, which are indicated by the black dots here, and compared them to their size. And we then added the wild halibut into this uh, relationship. And we actually find very similar patterns um, in between tail beat frequency and length as we'd already discovered in uh, Pollock and Safe. So this is very interesting because it seems to indicate that we would expect higher tail beat frequencies for smaller animals and uh, lower tail beat frequencies for larger animals, which goes into, which points towards at least using this as an estimate of um, potential activity, um, as well as if we can, if we can decrease these prediction intervals across this uh, relationship, a potential to use tail beat frequency as a predictor of length, which would be 
uh, very interesting for measurements of growth rate. So this is, of course, a work in progress. Um, we've now uh, been able to extract swim activity and uh, movement. Seems like there's a very strong uh, uh, driver of uh, movement due to the tidal patterns as well as some sort of diurnal pattern. Also, uh, these animals seem to be higher, highly active during dusk. Um, we don't see something similar during dawn, but again, there's still uh, one month of data to analyze. And uh, it, th these data indicate that Tom and tail frequency may be a function of size during steady swimming. Uh, we've also, something that I haven't mentioned yet, but we've also found that um, determining activity patterns in halibut, we really need the accelerometer because previously people have been doing this with depth records, but it's just not enough. The resolution isn't enough and animals actually are quite active on the substrate. So um, it's not that they go up and down the water column to feed, but they actually move around the substrate quite a lot. They might not be dislocating a lot, but they do actually, um, they, they employ a kind of a search pattern while they're on the substrate. Um, so while they're using water, they're mostly using water depth that's lower than 60 meters, we really need the acceleration series to be able to say more about the activity levels in these fish. The next steps are actually to relate the activity to the depth um, levels and then start cross-correlating activity, either tail weight frequency or average levels of activity to environmental variables, such as actually getting a statistical estimate on how well this is correlated to tide. And what is the difference across these individuals? Are we actually seeing differences or are they very similar animals? Um, I've talked a lot about these kind of case studies that I've done, but I also want to give a very brief overview on the trends in biologging, uh, especially in, in fisheries research. And of course, there are some technological issues and potential solutions as far as uh, I've at least um, worked with them. And uh, one of the major issues that we have is data retrieval. In the few field studies that I've conducted, we've used mostly uh, pop-up satellite tags where uh, these tags were deployed on the animals, released after some preset time, and then we used a VHF transmitter or Argos uh, technology to be able to physically locate them. However, this is very expensive and it's, uh, it's difficult in rough environments. So you almost have to be in some sort of sheltered bay uh, when, when the tags release. Uh, to the other way of obtaining data is through telemetry, underwater telemetry, for example. There's issues with transmission limits and high frequency acceleration data can easily be transmitted to a satellite or underwater and therefore needs onboard processing. So what we really need to do is develop algorithms that we can implement into the microprocessor to use to um, translate the acceleration data into, for example, behavior, and then transmit that to a receiver or a satellite. So that would be one way of obtaining the data. However, one um, other means, and this is especially relevant in fisheries research, is uh, just using the catch and release fishery. So for example, what could be done is using high volume, low cost tagging technology um, and implement this, this kind of technology in an active fishery with okay return rates. So anything that's higher than 10%, I think, would be useful because this would then actually uh, result in a decreased cost per data point. So moving away from pop-up satellite tagging into high volume, low cost tagging, where, where thousands of tags, and if, if volume, tag volumes of this magnitude are actually produced, it could end up being fairly affordable, are released or are tagged into an active fishery. For example, um, this could be a halibut fishery. And then in over three years, 10 to 15% of these animals would be returned and therefore the tags could be obtained directly. And this could be potentially an, another avenue that, that we could start looking into. Another technological issue is logging duration tag size. Of course, we need to consider battery limitations and uh, this could be uh, mitigated by duty cycling of the tag. When we deployed these tags on the halibut, we have one month's worth of very high resolution data, but these animals are somewhat predictable and it might not be necessary to continuously sample at such high frequencies. But again, this obviously depends on the study question, but for long-term 
in uh, studies, it could be useful to implement some sort of duty cycling. And of course, in the sampling frequency needs to be considered. Another option is to develop a smart tag that, uh, for example, turns on given some sort of acceleration threshold. And this could be really interesting for animals that are most of their time stationary, again, such as a halibut, that uh, only spends 20% of its day in actual activity mode and most of its time being stationary on the substrate. So this could be a, an avenue that, that would be worth looking into. And other trends in biology are incre is, is uh, the change in research scope. So a lot of the work that I've done and some others is um, individual based. So tracking a few animals at a time, getting very high resolution data on information and behavior. But I think that the trend is moving towards population and ecosystem based research and, for example, inter- and intraspecific interactions, for example, predator-prey relationships. And I'm involved in a project that is looking at predator-prey relationships between uh, gray seals and Atlantic cod. And what we've actually done is tagged, uh, tagged seals with, um, with movement tags and cod with, with underwater telemetry tags. And the idea is that when seal and cod are interacting, we would be able to actually measure that interaction with this technology, and this is this is being done in the Atlantic. So we'll be I'll be working on on that data set soon, and that shows how we're moving away from individual based research to more of an inter inter intra specific interaction based research, and that could go up to the assemblage level. For example, work has been done on vertical spatial overlap and ecosystem interactions using pop up satellite tags of different species, but with this accelerometer technology, we could actually get an, an another level of information within these interactions. Other applications that I haven't talked about but I think are very promising, especially in, in fisheries research, are tags as a diagnostic tool in aquaculture, for example, to estimate feeding and consumption rates. They could be used to estimate disease. As, I, as I've already shown, we've been able to estimate um, a parasite load where the tag was really the parasite in Atlantic cod. So this, this technology could be very easily transferred to actually measure parasite load and um, growth. So the, the accelerometer sensors could be implement, could actually serve as a diagnostic tool in aquaculture. Of course, the cost of the instrumentation would have to be significantly re reduced uh, compared to what, what we're uh, working with now. Um, there's applications in, term, in developing long-term data sets that would allow us to relate fine scale behavior during migration patterns to things such as spawning. This is, for example, a case in the halibut spawning migrations that is very poorly understood. Another opportunity to use accelerometers is as a validation tool. For example, we're working on a project um, that uses uh, state-based models of animal tracks to estimate behavioral states. And we're actually using the accelerometer as a validation tool to see how these space-based models are performing in terms of um, uh, being able to classify transiting or, or foraging movements of these tagged animals. Another thing that I'm really interested in is using tag data or assimilating tag data such as acceleration, swimming velocity, and size uh, in models that provide temperature and flow fields. And this is somewhat being done with, uh, with bioprobes, such as seals that carry CT, that, that uh, give us CTD data. But what, what I'm really interested in, in doing is using these data outputs from these different tags to determine most likely trajectories and growth rates in these animals in a virtual ocean. And there's some work being done on eel migrations, and I think there's a lot of possibilities that, that these kinds of data sets could be implemented in ocean models. Not necessarily as inform, informing ocean models, but more of an exercise of estimating animal migration in the ocean. Another opportunity to use these tags is in kinematics and biomechanics studies. This could include measuring things such as flow refuging, size-dependent kinematics, even potentially hydromechanical efficiency of fish schooling. And especially in combination with flow visualization, it could really give us a very good idea on how kinematics and biomechanics and fish swimming is actually working. And if, if um, tag size could be further reduced, we could potentially even tag different parts of the body of the animal and then get a really 
uh, nice picture on the um, three-dimensional movement across the body during swimming, which is a topic in research that's been it's been mostly answered with video data and flow visualization, but the accelerometer could, could add another part to this whole um, research. Just to sum it up, I think that if we, if we proceed in the technological advances as quickly as we have in the last few years, and especially considering power, tech, uh, battery power, tag attachment, advance our data processing, decrease tag sizes, and really think about how to best recover these data sets, we can get a really um, nice picture of uh, fish physiology and morphology, behavior and movement, and could potentially start looking into how to relate this to abiotic factors and biotic factors. And this would really give us a nice picture on evolutionary processes, ecological processes, and conservations. And that um, concludes my presentation. I would like to thank uh, all the people that are involved in this research, as well as the different funding agencies. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions, if there are questions from the audience, which I am going to yes okay John is asking a question and he would like to know um, which animal that I've worked with was the most difficult to tag physically um, and also the one whose movement was most difficult to interpret so the the most difficult to tag was really um, Atlantic cod. Surprisingly, they're very simple fish, but when we externally tagged them, we discovered these um, these scouring movements, as I already explained in the presentation. And I was not expecting that, especially given uh, the um, experience I'd had with other species, such as the sculpin and the pollock and the sturgeon, which reacted extremely well to to the to the tag load. So I would say I would stay away from tagging Atlantic cod in the future, or at least tag them internally, because I think that that doesn't irritate them as much. So the question of irritation is something that I hadn't previously considered. I was always concerned with the weight and the drag, but it seems to be that any kind of external attachment could um, cause a sense of irritation in the animal. Um, the second question is, uh, what movement was most di difficult to interpret? And I would say that I had a very hard time in the beginning with the um, sculpin movement, um, the, the, the animal where I showed you the videos, because those kinds of movements are extremely fast and they're very complicated. And while it seems like our eyes can visually distinguish between the two time series, it's actually very difficult to determine a statistically powerful technique to do this reliably. So uh, it was a lot, it took me a lot longer to actually develop these algorithms that I had initially hoped. Because it turns out that our brain is actually really, really good at pattern detection, but getting a computer to do this is not as easy as you may think. And I think that is it for the questions. In case anybody, if anybody has, has another question, I'd be more than happy to answer it. And if not, then I will end it. Thanks, everyone. I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk.